Good morning, good morning. Let me invite you to find a seat. If you would, we're going to begin. Miss Joyce. Miss Joyce, turn and greet everyone on camera. Welcoming everyone who is joining us by live stream this morning, as well as those who are here with us today. We are so delighted that you have come and are here with us. This is the place where Great Commission meets, of course, but throughout the week we're scattered and spread all over Somerville and around the world. So welcome those who are still streaming with us, and we're so delighted that you're here. Let me share with you a few announcements today. Uh, first, uh, we're still planning right now, as of today, our summer kids, um, a way to transition back to our children's ministries, and that's being put together. Reed Phillips is, is working on that, and students who are here this morning, um, he'd like to meet with you, those who are going to be helping just briefly after our worship time, so if you would meet with Reed, raise your hand, Reed, just so everybody knows who you are, I think they do, but nonetheless, there you go. Um, so that's coming 6 to 7.30 Wednesday nights through the month of July as we prepare for August to um, hopefully, by God's grace, be back with our kids down at our kids' corner. Next Sunday, we want to let you know we're going to be doing Lord's Supper, and we want to announce that to you ahead of time so that if you have any concerns, what we're going to be doing is we've got some single-serve um, elements that you'll be able to use and so they'll be available. We're not going to pass a plate with bread and drinks and all of that. They'll be on a table. You'll be able to pick those up and use those, and we will have a chance to together join in in remembering um, what Christ has done and looking forward to where Christ is going to take us. So next Sunday, June the 28th, we'll be doing Lord's Supper. Then, uh, also want to let you know we're still planning June the 27th, which is this upcoming Saturday, 4 o'clock, in the Ashboro East Clubhouse. Ms. Sharon Caldwell and the Caldwell Care Group is going to be putting on a um, I Do Barbecue for Alex and Carly as they plan for their wedding that's going to be happening July the 10th. Uh, so we want to come out and help them prepare and just honor them and love them and encourage them as they prepare for that day. And to let you know, uh, in case you're tentative on that for um, health reasons and social issues, we want to let you know the food is going to be served cafeteria style. The servers will be wearing masks. They'll have gloves, and there will only be bottled water. Um, so no cups will be used, and there will be outdoor seating available for those who may want that. So 4 o'clock, June the 27th, taking all the precautions that we can. We want to um, honor you guys and love you as you prepare for your wedding day. So that's going to be an exciting time. So if you need more information, not there, over there, see Miss Sharon Caldwell and she can get that to you. And then, uh, as always, we want to encourage you to gather outside after our worship time just for um, social distancing purposes and those things. Now, as we gather today, these are all great things coming up, but we want to come and consider, uh, you know, as we think about, like we shared last week, these very interesting times in which we're living right now. All of the unrest, all of the commotion, all of the issues that are happening all around us what's going on, you might be asking, but I think the better question is not just what's going on, but how does God intend to use me right now at this moment for the spread of the gospel and the proclamation of His glory and His name through Jesus Christ? And how is He perfectly positioning you for that purpose? That's what we're going to be looking at. It's kind of a follow-up to where we were last week, but as we're looking at Paul's life in Acts chapter 22, we're going to see a very unique moment um, that positions him for a great opportunity that is all a part of God's design, God's will, and God's plan for Paul's life. And maybe you've never considered what's God's will and God's plan and God's design for your life. Why has he positioned you 
at this time, at this moment, in this place, or not this place, or wherever you might be by streaming video, what, what is he doing, and how should you walk through that faithfully and obediently? That's what we're going to look at today, and as we do that, let me ask you, if you would, to bow your heads and prepare your hearts for worship, and then Michael will lead us in prayer in just a few moments. So if you would, silently prepare yourselves to worship right now. Here with us, you are sovereign, you are Lord over everything. God, we thank you that there is no other God but you, and that we can sing that with truth, we can sing that with certainty. We thank you that you've given us your word to delight in. We thank you that you have revealed your face to us in Jesus Christ, who loved us and gave himself as the propitiation for our sins. God, we ask that you would move today through our worship, that our hearts and minds would be more conformed to the likeness of your Son, and that we would see you and savor you more rightly and delight in you more fully. We love you, we praise you, and we pray this in your Son's name. Amen. Wherever you are, if you would stand and sing with us.
sorry. I'll get reorganized here in a second. Okay. Reading Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret. Intricately woven, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O oh God! How vast is the sum of them! If I would count them, they are more than the sand. I am awake, and I am still with you. Amen. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O oh God. O oh, men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O oh Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. Oh, uh -huh. 
Let us pray. Lord God, we come to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we come here, Lord, to worship you. And hopefully, Lord, we pray that you guide us to worship you in spirit and in truth, that indeed we may glorify your name as we worship you today. And we pray, Lord, that as Pastor Mike preaches the word in the book of Acts, your Holy Spirit may lead him 
And may you also lead us to be attentive and in the spirit of prayer to hear your message. Lord, we see in that chapter of Acts, Acts that uh, the people dealing with Paul and opposing the apostle, they were very religious people, yet they did not know you. They had a religion without a gospel. And help us to stay away from that. So we may look for the real thing. We may look for the gospel. We may look for the truth. We may look to worship you. And also help us to see your providence in everything. Because I know for myself, a lot of time I desire to do things my own way. But we are so grateful that your Holy Spirit point us the way through the word so that we may indeed glorify you and help us to be open to your will that Christ may be glorified. <coughs> glorified. We pray, Lord, in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen. You can stand and sing with us.
Show us Christ. Show us Christ. Show us Christ, O oh God. Show us Christ, O oh God. preaching of your word until every heart confesses Christ is Lord Amen God we thank you that you alone have the words of eternal life we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us and that you are continuing to show us glimpses of your glory. God, we ask that in this time of preaching and teaching that you would move in our minds and our hearts so that we might see you more rightly and, and delight in you more fully because you are good and there's no one like you. Lord, speak to us through your word so that every heart and tongue might confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We love you and we praise you. We pray this song in your son's name. Amen. Thank you. As you're being seated, let me invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 22. We're going to be looking at verses 22 through 29 this morning as we continue to follow along this movement of what God is doing through these apostles, but by the Holy Spirit because of the work that Jesus did for us. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 22, looking specifically at verses 22 through 29 this morning. Let me read our text for us, if I may, please. Up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust in the air, the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. But when they had stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it lawful for you to flog a man who's a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, what, what are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, yes. And the tribune answered, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. And Paul said, but I'm a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately, and the tribune also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. This is the word of God. Who were your parents? Who are your parents? What was their story? Where did they come from? Who were your grandparents? Who are your grandparents? Maybe they're still living. What was their story? Where did they come from? How about your great-grandparents? Do you even know their names? What was their story? Where did they come from? How about your great-great-grandparents? Do you have any clue? Anybody know their great, great grandparents' names? Okay, uh, one person in this room. What was their, nevertheless, there was a story to them. There was a life that they lived. Where did they come from? Where did they go? What did they do? What were their connections? Think about this morning the odds of you with the story behind you, with all of the people that made you, and today, at this moment, at this hour, at this time, you're here right 
now with all of these other people who have no clue who their great great grandparents are nevertheless the the amalgam of the odds that has brought us together either here physically or by live stream why did you click the button today and maybe you didn't last week or the previous week or maybe you have been why are we here today and what are the odds and what's the story that has brought us together at this moment right now one of the great things that I love to do, this is just kind of one of the pieces for me as a pastor, is I love to kind of know little bits and pieces of your stories, and then when people come to visit or join with us, I hear their story, and I start going through the scan of my database, and I think, oh, you need to meet Robbie. You need to meet Alex. No, you need to meet Nick. You, I mean, one of the first people I think I probably connected you, Nick, with was Kelly. Why? Why? Because there's a common story there. If you want to know what it is, just listen to them talk. But I love to make these connections and to see this thing that God is doing and putting together this mosaic, this tapestry that He's weaving together perfectly to declare His glory through Jesus Christ in what He's done for us. So, for example, how many of you remember the Hawks? Aaron and Michelle? Okay, of course, everyone in that back table, because that was their care group, and some of you as well. They came to us for a very brief time. In fact, their story was very clear, very upfront. Hey, we're looking for a place. Somebody referred us to you, and we're here in a transitory time until such a time as God releases us to a ministry position. And I'm thinking, okay, man, what am I going to do with this? God, what are you doing here? What? What are we going to do? And one of the things that I tried to do as I'm going through, not just here on Sunday mornings, but wherever I am, I happen to be yesterday, my wife is away, so Mike gets to play. I happen to be at the beach, and I paddled out, and I struck up this conversation, imagine that, I struck up this conversation with a guy named Ed. And Ed said, hey, what's your story? And you know, I said, you know, what's yours? And we're back and forth, and he said, I mean, my normal thing at the beach is, do you, are you from here or are you just visiting? He said, oh, we live in St. George. I thought, well, that's, you know, very interesting. Then it turns out, just because I, I'm always trying to gear conversation wherever I am, whether it's a restaurant or the beach, to make a connection, I said, Have you, you know, where do you worship? Well, we've been worshiping at a place in Somerville, but then we just felt like God wanted us to connect in the town where we're living. And I said, imagine that. I know a guy who's just become a pastor in St. George. What were the odds that Ed and I would meet in the water and at the perfect time there was a guy in St. George who had come by my path that I could connect together for the glory of God to do ministry in St. George. Now, how is God going to use that? I pray that it's to bring revival into St. George. But perhaps it's something different. Perhaps they don't even make a connection at all. But at least for this moment, I saw God's hand moving in the hawks and in this guy that I met at the beach. And now they're in this same common place with the same goal, both of them, brothers in Christ, who want to see a mission work accomplished in St. George. Now, the truth is you have that opportunity too, wherever you are. And the question is, will you be intentional to see that wherever you are, whatever you're doing, God has perfectly positioned you in that moment, at that time, at that spot for His glory and His time. That's why last week we said um, one of the things that we have to understand that living on mission as believers, we realize that to live as Christians means to see the reality that God is the main actor in history. See, Paul understood this, and we need to understand this as well, is that Paul's life was not his own any longer. And it wasn't for his own. His life belonged to God. He was redeemed. He was created by God, redeemed by Christ, and now no longer was his life his own, but his life was for the glory of God and to proclaim the name of Jesus wherever he was. So, you know, maybe you've been waiting for mission trips to really get on mission. Well, what are you waiting for? 
Every day, you're on a mission trip. Wherever you are, wherever you're going, at work, in the neighborhood, at the restaurant, in the grocery store, at school, wherever you are, you're on a mission trip, and you have the opportunity to live as if God is the main actor in our world, and that your life is not about you, it's really about King Jesus. Now, If we're really going to see this from our text today, what I want us to see is three kind of shifts in the text. We're going to look at a mob, God's providence, and God's will. That's what we're going to look at today to really um, position us to think we need to live intentionally realizing that our lives are not our own either. They're God's, and we're here for Him. So we're going to look at a mob, God's providence, and then God's will. We'll take them in that order. So first, let's take a look at the mob. And what I want you to see here, um, specifically from verse 22, is this. Religion, if you're just clinging to religion, it's devoid of the gospel. It's deadly, not just in the future, it's deadly right now. Um, And let me just pause, by the way, if you haven't had a chance in your quarantine days to uh, set some time to watch on Netflix a little show, American Gospel. Um, if Watch it this week. Watch it with your family. It is amazingly good, and it's, it's along the lines of what I'm talking about today and um, what it is that I think God wants to do with us. American Gospel, dads, watch it with your family. Husbands, wives, watch it together. Watch it more than once. You may need to um, really process it and, and watch it. American Gospel. And don't be confused by the title. Um, It is solidly good, and I recommend it to you. And know, while I recommend it, you may be offended by it. But the reason is because religion, devoid of the gospel, isn't just deadly in the future. It can be deadly right now. I mean, we're living in a time when... Um, very religious and very spiritual and very emotion-driven people are crusadering their causes. And many of that on the left and the right, spiritual, religious, emotional people are doing things devoid of the gospel. And it's deadly. And we're seeing the death that's coming. But notice what happens here, the deadliness Um, that was a real threat to Paul. Notice verse 22 in in Acts 22. Up to this word, it says, they listened to him. Now, what was that word? The word was, God, through a vision, called me to go far away from Jerusalem to Gentile people and declare the gospel to them. That was blasphemous for Jewish people in Jerusalem to hear. For them to hear that God would command Paul to go and preach salvation to Gentiles with no no difference than Jewish people can't be. In fact, I mean, one of the prayers that a, a Jewish man would pray is, God, thank you that you haven't made me to be a dog, a woman, or a Gentile. So there was this very real ethnic, um, racist tendency that was dwelling in the hearts of these people. And the thought that God would tell Paul to go to Gentiles was absolutely abhorrent to these people. So much so that notice what they said, because this is outside of their realm of thinking, this meant death. Notice what they said, away with such a man from the earth. Now, literally what this means is lift up this man, carry him to oblivion, remove him, take him up and lift him away. And and notice the pronoun especially betrays their racism here. It's not just away with Paul, it's away with this man or literally such a man as this. Anyone who would espouse such a thing as that needs to be removed from this earth completely. If you say that salvation is for the Gentiles with with no difference of salvation being for the Jews, by grace, through faith, by a spirit work, through Jesus, forget it. 
you deserve to die. That's the very same thing that Paul was trying to kill people as a persecutor of those of the way. And notice they even add to it. I mean, if it can get any stronger than that, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. Literally, it means it's not fitting that a man such as this should keep on breathing the air that we're breathing. Well, that's not literal, the end. That's my paraphrase. It's not fitting that a man like this should keep on living. They had a belief that their unique status as God's people was based on their ethnic identity. But friends, we need to understand the gospel is the ultimate expression of ethnic unity. In fact, God's love for us is not at all based on anything that we value at all. This is why in Galatians 3.28, Paul makes it very clear that the gospel offer of salvation through grace is open unrestricted to anyone who might respond and believe, and it doesn't matter the demographic. There is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free. It doesn't matter. All of us, in whatever, quote, demographic we might find ourselves lumped in, are found wanting at the foot of the cross and in need at the foot of the cross. And so, that's what I love about the gospel, is that it tears down every dividing wall that we create and what it actually does, what the gospel does, is it creates a new humanity in the image of Jesus Christ so that for, for now, those who are followers of Jesus, there's no more labels that we carry that define ourselves other than this. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm in Christ. In fact, for Paul, there's only really two labels that matter. We looked at this in 2 Corinthians, if you remember. I no longer consider anyone from earthly lenses, but only through Christ. They're either in Christ or in Adam. They're either alive or dead. Everyone you meet this week will fall into those categories. Those are the only labels that matter. And this is where it gets really tricky. Because most of the people that you meet, I might even say all of the people that you meet, they're not going to consider themselves dead. They're going to consider themselves probably pretty good. In fact, um, if you go watch that American Gospel, have you ever seen any of the Ray Comfort um, evangelism strategy and, and stuff that he does? He, he's got this amazing thing and he just, you know, basically asked somebody, you know, tell me about yourself. What about you? You know, are you, are you a good person? You, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And invariably, everyone that he asks, yeah, I'm a good, I'm, you know, I'm a sweet, just fun loving lady or guy. I mean, I'm good. And then he always follows it up with this. So you ever told a lie? Well, not big lies, but, you know, white lies, just little ones, I mean, um, but, but not really bad lies. I mean, so, you know, we want to think of ourselves as being good in our lying. Then he says, oh, did you ever taken anything, stolen anything? And invariably, one after another, yeah, I've lied. I, I got to be honest with you, I've lied. Yeah, I've taken things gets to the adultery, you ever committed adultery, keep in mind, he says, that Jesus said that if you've looked lustfully at a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery, guilty. You ever use the Lord's name in vain, guilty. I mean, in one after another, and he just uses the law in the way it's meant to be used to show us we're not good people. We're dead. 
And he doesn't leave them trying to think, okay, well, here's what you do. Get better at the Ten Commandments and then you'll be good. No, because that would leave people crushed by the weight of trying to do good because none of us are good people. That's what the Bible tells us. And there's not one that does good. And that's why each and every Sunday, I don't want you to leave here thinking, what must I do? I want you to leave here marveling and amazed at how great a thing God has done for you in Jesus Christ. And so he just shifts them and says, you, you can't be good. And that's the reality. That's what the Bible says. And we needed somebody who would be good for us. King Jesus. And as we're talking about this this morning, you know, truthfully, I want to be careful here how I push this because we are living in a moment of incredible ethnic confusion. And what I'm trying to do, I think, is remind us today that our decisions about these issues that we're facing at this time, at this moment where God has positioned us, they can't be worldly tools. It can't be Marxist intersectionality, nor can it be capitalist democracy. That will not solve the issues in our world today, neither one of them. But the gospel will, because the gospel creates a new humanity, and it removes all hints of any ability for us to hold on to any racist tendencies within us. And so, we've for this to happen, we've got to be gospel-thinking people, and what we value should be carefully considered, and we should allow room for differing opinions, but yet, ultimately, what we need to realize is that we're not looking for a moment in history that we savor, but rather we look to the cross, and we look forward to Christ's return. That's the side of history we want to be on. And so, as we're combating and confronting all of these things that are happening, I just, you know, does your position that you're holding to, does it advance the gospel for the glory of God? That's why we're here. So, whether it's tearing down statues or keeping them up, is it for the advancement of the gospel for the glory of God that you hold those positions, or is it some other thing? And that's why I say religion devoid of the gospel is deadly now, and people are dying for these things. But we are different. We're created in Christ for a new purpose and a new life altogether, and we're His, and we're His to to show and to see and let the world know that the main actor in history is not us, it's God. It's His story. Now, with that, Let's take a look at number two, God's providence, and realize today that God has perfectly brought us to this place right now. With all of the story that makes up who you are, and it's not just your story, by the way, it's your parents' story, and your grandparents, and your great-grandparents, and your great-great-grandparents, all of the things that have brought you to this place right now, it's been God's hand that has moving and weaving to bring you right here. I mean, just look around our room. We've got people from multiple different countries and people watching from multiple different places all over the globe. God is doing something bigger than what we could do on our own. And Paul knew that God had brought him perfectly to this moment, so he was ready to give an answer or a reason for the hope that resided within him. I know that's more Peter than Paul, but These guys are at the same mission, and they're at the same thing. And so everywhere we go, we should be thinking, and it doesn't matter where you are, at work, in the restaurant, in your neighborhood, at the beach, wherever you are, you should be thinking, how can I faithfully be obedient to God and declare the message of reconciliation in this moment? God, how are you opening the doors? Because I've made some decisions that brought me here, but ultimately, Proverbs is pretty clear. The king's hand, or the king's life is like this water that God is shaping and moving for his purposes and his glory. And your life too. So, in any given moment where you find yourself, how are you perfectly positioned in that moment to be obedient to God and to look for opportunities to declare the message of reconciliation? And that's what Paul's doing, I think, right here. 
Notice what happens, verse 23. So as the crowd is shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, I mean, this is a commotion. This is a riot. This is like crazy. This is, could be ripped from the headlines today. As this commotion is happening, the assumption basically is this. This guy has, has had to have committed some kind of grievous crime, and so the idea is, this is the way Rome worked. Here's the guy causing the commotion. Why did you cause it? Paul, come on in here. We want to talk, and the talking isn't going to be face-to-face. -face. It's going to be our face to your back, and we're going to beat the truth out of you. Notice what it says. The tribune, tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by what? By flogging. Not examined by a sweet little interrogation, but by flogging. We're going to beat the truth out of you. This is the way the Pax Romana worked, by the way. You disturb peace in Rome, you're going to die. We wield the sword, and we do it to keep the peace. We have a much bigger sword than you do, and we've got more troops than you do. There are about 5 million Roman citizens, about 52 million in the Roman Empire, 5 million citizens. The rest of them were either slaves or army or working for the citizens to keep the peace of Rome. They had a sword, and they had plenty of people that they would use to put down your riot or your commotion. And by the way, flogging, it's not mom or dad saying, hey, go out to the tree and get a little switch and you go cut the smallest one, you know, or some kind of fly swatter or something like that. Flogging was basically a wooden handle with leather straps at the end of which would be either bone or metal tied onto them in, in multiple places and you would be beaten, usually barebacked on your back until you told the truth, at which point you would either be imprisoned, enslaved, or killed. It's not a pleasant experience. And they would, by the way, either put you at on the ground or tie you to a post with your wrists fastened, or they would suspend you from a ceiling so that you couldn't flinch and deflect like my kids used to do. <laughs> Sorry. So here's Paul. He's about to be flogged and whipped. By the way, we've already been told something about Paul Back in Acts chapter 16, he was already bound and whipped once, at which point he demanded to see the authorities and told them, hey, do you know what you just did? We're Roman citizens, at which point they were terrified, they escorted him out of the city, we're so sorry, they, they were apologizing profusely, please just go on your way, Paul, just leave our town, never come back, and all will be forgotten and good. But notice verse 25, but when they had stretched him out for the whip, see the previous time he disclosed it after the whipping, this time Paul says to the centurion, it, it might have been as the whip is back that he said, do you know what you're about to do? Is it lawful for you to flog a man who's a Roman citizen and uncondemned? This was, was huge because to, to arrest or bound, bind a Roman citizen was a death deserving death, or was a punishment deserving death or a crime that deserved death in Roman law. So this tribune and centurion who had bound Paul could be killed for what they had done. And notice verse 26, that's why he says, when he heard this, he went to the tribune and he said to him, what are you about to do? This man is a Roman citizen.
Now, why not go through another beating? I mean, Paul had been beaten before. He'd been detained before. He'd gone through a host of other sufferings. He had been stoned. But for the most part, most of those things came at the hands of Jewish leaders more than Roman leaders. And, you know, by the way, if someone just shouts out, I'm a Roman citizen, to to avoid being beaten, and it was proven that they were not a Roman citizen, you could be killed for that too. So, How does Paul prove his Roman citizenship here? Because every Roman citizen actually is given a toga. Apparently, he's not wearing the dress because he doesn't look the part. And there's different kinds of Roman citizenship that he has. But every citizen, it's not really like a passport because there's no pictures and it's not a driver's license. But every Roman citizen does have papers And it's not common for the Roman citizens to travel, so Paul, likely traveling as much as he is, has his papers to prove and to show, look, from birth, Roman citizen. So he's got this paper from the government that shows and declares, indeed, this man is a Roman citizen. Now he's kind of shocked in this moment, because notice verse 27, the tribune comes to him and says, you're a Roman citizen, you know, obviously he's not dressed the part, he doesn't look the part, he doesn't look the distinguished Roman man. No, he's itinerant evangelist who is a Roman citizen by the grace of God, but yet is on a much bigger mission than expanding the Roman Empire. He's declaring the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ by the power of the Spirit. And Paul says, yeah, And so the tribune answers and says, and it's kind of implicit in his comment here, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. Basically, how could a guy like you bribe your way into being a citizen like I did? You? I I bought my citizenship for a large price, which is something that you could do. By the way, if you were not a citizen, you were a slave which puts you in a completely different social status in the Roman Empire. But Paul ups the ante, and notice what he says. He's not just any kind of Roman citizen. What does it say? But I am a citizen, what? By birth. In other words, I outrank you in society, my friend. You see, why is Paul a citizen? Because in God's grace, at this moment, it would open the door for the story of God through the Apostle Paul to move from Jerusalem to Rome. How do I know that? Well, because that's what we're going to find out next week. God's going to tell Paul, hey, Paul, your story doesn't end in Jerusalem. Just as you've declared the facts about me in Jerusalem, you're going to do it in Rome too. He's not dying today. He might die in Rome if that's God's plan for him, and eventually he will. But at this moment, The story is moving, and the reason he's able to go to Rome is because in a few weeks, we'll get over into chapter 26, I think it is, where Paul says, look, you're not just going to let me go after this. I appeal to Caesar, which was the right of a Roman citizen, to which later we're going to find, in a few weeks after that, they say, Paul, if you hadn't done that, you would be set free you'd be a free man. But now, because you've appealed to Rome, we've got to keep you bound and send you off to Rome. And the only reason that's able to happen is because somewhere in the past, either his parents or his grandparents, 
somehow found the favor and the ability to become Roman citizens to which Paul was born into, to which at this moment right here, when God brought him to this place, he was able to pull that card out and the gospel would go to Rome through Paul. You see, God's providence has positioned you perfectly for God's story to advance in you too. All the collection of who you are and that long line of ancestry that you don't even know about has brought you to this place today, right now, and this week where God is going to use that for His glory. Now, sometimes we get to see it, like the Hawks and Ed, and, but not sure what's going to happen there just yet, but sometimes we don't. But what we are in the midst is we've got this perspective that says, I'm not here for me, I'm here for God. I'm here for His story, which is why we can finally look at God's will. God's servants rely on God's grace while trusting God's timing. God's servants, like Paul and like you and me, rely on God's grace, all of His grace, while trusting God's timing. See, God's working everything according to the counsel of His will. That's what a sovereign God does. And part of God's grace is not just, by the way, the grace that comes to us through Jesus Christ. That, that's huge. But there's other ways that God's grace is moving and is active and on display in our world. Why do we find ourselves governed by the government that we're governed by? Why is there a government? Because that's a part of God's grace. It's part of the moral fabric and fiber of the world that He created. In fact, there's basically three institutions in our world, all of them created by God. There's marriage in the home, which was created by God, first institution. Then there was government and order that he placed in this world. And then the third one is the church. And you can be sure that when any of those three places lose their moorings to this sovereign God who's working to bring redemption to wayward worshipers, problems happen and riots and mobs go. Now, don't hear me. I'm not saying this morning, America, the, you know, the blessed nation, the nation of... That, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not trying to go into political philosophy here. I'm simply saying there's an order in our world. Why is it? And the reason there's government is because that's a thing that God has created into our world. Look. Look at Seattle. That little was eight block, I think it's now down to about six block, free zone, quote, free zone, right? Was Chaz, then they renamed it CHOP. I don't know that I want to live in a place called CHOP. But even there in that free of any, quote, governmental oppression, guess what you find? You still find some kind of order. It's not an order that I would want to live under, but nevertheless, there's an order. There's somebody organizing. There's somebody directing. There's people policing. There's, there's people looking and watching. Why are those things there? Because even the anarchist can't get out of some type of order. Why is that? Because God has placed it as the fabric of this world that we are people who organize and have governings over us. And whether you recognize it or not, guess what? And whether it may be really good or really bad. Now, keep in mind, this is Rome, and by the end of um, the New Testament anyway, Rome was called Babylon, which is not a good descriptor. Nevertheless, the ongoing command is to submit to the authorities over you because they're ministers of God's grace to you. 
And what we see here in Acts 22 is Paul, the servant of God, is looking at this government with all of its brokenness and all of its flaws, just like ours, and he's saying, there's an element of God's grace here, and I can cling to it. I'm a citizen. And so he goes to the government and uses it for the advancement of the gospel and the name of Jesus Christ. See, that's the key. He's not living to advance his story. He's living to advance the kingdom and the name of Jesus Christ. And he appeals to the laws that were perfectly within his rights to appeal to. So much so, notice verse 29. Those who are about to examine him, <laughs> which is kind of a really sweet way of saying it. They were about to flog him almost probably to the point of death, if not death. They withdrew from him immediately, and the tribune was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen, and he had bound him, which meant that tribune could be punished by death himself. In fact, later we're going to see how he kind of softens things and um, kind of spins the story. But nevertheless, right now, from this point on, Paul is going to enjoy protection by the state, even though it's still imprisoned, but it's going to be for his own good so that he might have the benefits of a Roman citizen. But nevertheless, what we see here is Paul is appealing to this secular state who, whether they recognize it or not, are working as a minister of God's grace, and they're positioned to bring about God's providential will. How? because they're going to be the ones who transport Paul from Jerusalem through Caesarea to Rome. And Paul's doing all of this because he's moving to advance the interests of the gospel. And friends, I want to encourage us at this time and moment that we find ourselves be careful of the side and the position that you get caught up in the, in, the, in the political debate. And ask yourself, why am I clinging to my position? Is it because that's what my parents believed? Is it because that's what sounds logical to me? Or is it because I want to advance the name of Jesus Christ for the glory of God? And why is that important? Because there's a greater sense where every one of us in this room were held in bondage by the most ultimate oppressor, sin and death and the grave. And every single one of us in this room was incapacitated and we were spiritually dead. And there was nothing that I could appeal to that would make a difference in the court of heaven. I'm white. I'm male, I'm an American, born in Washington, D.C., that's got to put me at the top of being American, born at Washington Hospital Center where they take presidents, I mean, that's got to give me extra clout, right? Went to Fairfax County Public Schools, which were the best in the nation, went to a public Ivy College, William & Mary, I mean, I know it's not Ivy League, but I mean, it's right there, that's got to count for something, was an athlete, even won awards, was all conference my freshman year. That's got to be worth something. I can serve. Doesn't that work? And none of that stuff makes a difference because still in all of that, apart from the gospel in Jesus Christ, I am a slave bound with sin and death and the grave looking ahead of me. And none of that could release me from sin, and none of that would remove the death sentence over me and the impending grave that was waiting for me in, like we read earlier, the days that God had allotted for me. But God, rich in mercy, and because of the very great love with which He loved me and us, He seated me alive made me alive and seated me with Christ Jesus. And he redeemed me 
and He cleansed me with His Spirit and with the Word, and now I can no longer live for myself because now I'm not a slave to sin in fear of death and the grave. Now I am a bondservant of Jesus Christ, and more than that, I am a brother of the King and an heir of all things. And so now I'm no longer living for myself and no longer living to advance things that are emotionally appealing to me or logically right to me. I'm living to advance the one who loved me and rescued me from slavery and sin and death. And friend, you're in the same place on one side of that equation or the other. You're either in Adam and still enslaved to sin or you're in Christ. And if you're in Christ, free, live free as a, as a kingdom heir and proclaim the name of Jesus. See your life not as your own, but see yourself perfectly positioned where God has planted you to declare His name and His interests and not your own. At the end of that psalm, what did the psalmist say? I hate the things that you hate, God. Come to hate them as well. I've come to love the things that He loves. And so I met Ed. And in that moment, that wasn't just a random coincidence. In fact, that's the last word he and I had was, hey, there's no coincidence of why we met. Here's the information. Here's everything you need to know. I'll tell Aaron you're going to call him. I'll give him your number. And he said, thank you. But there's other guys. Pray for him. A guy by the name of Brian and Brad and Brandon, guys that I surf with that I'm trying to share Christ with and, and speak the name of Christ into those conversations. You've heard me share of the restaurant, Mi Pueblito. Go there. A guy named Alex worked there. He was the general manager. He's not there anymore. And I almost said to my men's guys on Tuesday, I said, guys, you know what? I think we might be free, except then I met a guy named John and a lady named Leonie. And so we're going to keep going back. You know why? Because John may join us for our Bible study. And Leonis, I'm hoping Lucy will go visit because she wants to learn English and she's looking for a Bible in Spanish and English. She's got this interest and in, why? I don't know, except that God's working a story of His glory in this world of how He's redeeming people and I'm trying to connect people and, and I'm seeing myself in this story, not for myself, but for His glory. And you are too. Wherever you are, wherever you find yourself, are you there because it's just what you like? Are you there because it's what you like? And oh, by the way, you want to be faithful and obedient and declare the name of Jesus in that moment. And I'm expecting that wherever I am, perfectly positioned, with freedom to advance the interest of the gospel, that's what I need to do. You know why? Because my story is not unique to me. That's the story of the world that we find ourselves in. It's a story of redemption. And God is the main actor in this story. And this morning, what I want you to leave with is thinking, I should be a slave, and yet I'm not because of the work that Jesus Christ did for me. So now, I live my life for him. He's the star of the show, the reality show that I call my life. Let's pray. Father, we praise you. We thank you for this story that is our story. And Father, we thank you that you have done everything that is necessary to be done for us to be made right with you. And Father, I pray that we would see that you are still working. You, you didn't just stop working at the end of Acts chapter 28. Your story has continued and it's flourished and it's been all over this world and it's moving and it's alive because you're still raising up saints who wait and, and rely on your grace as they proclaim your great name. And so Father, today, as we gather, as we meet, Father, would you remind us that we are no longer slaves and dead, but we're alive. If we have repented and trusted and turned and looked to Jesus for life, Father, we have found the one who can make us right with you. Father, help us to see our lives positioned now for your glory as your children declaring reconciliation 
to our friends and our family and our coworkers and our loved ones. And Father, for those who are watching or who are here who've just kind of been riding the wave of life, Father, help us to see that there's coming an impending day that every one of us apart from Jesus is enslaved to sin and death. Death is the right answer. And the grave awaits us. But Father, through Jesus, you have made a way for us to be released from that bondage. And now we can live as free men and women and children declaring your name by trusting in Christ and repenting and believing in him. Father, today, would many look to you and find life in Jesus. So, Father, as we sing this last song, move and work in our hearts so that this week as we go out on a mission trip, you will be proclaimed and you will be seen in the faithfulness of our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing a final song this morning.
Let's pray. Yeah, not I, Lord. Uh, just thank you so much for your providential hand working. Uh, just bringing us here for this message today, Lord. It is uh, ever so pertinent to our lives today. And just thank you for showing us that in the gospel, Lord. Let us always look to it for our answers. Uh, just be with us as we go through this week, Lord, those here uh, and those not with us. Uh, just continue to work in their lives. Continue to provide grace to us so that we may uh, be known for our love for each other. In your name we pray. Amen.